without further ado, Amrish Arora, ladies and gentlemen. Thank God for friends. Oops, sorry. So some acknowledgements, the photographs in here come from a lot of people, Randhir, Edmund, Andre, Shalin, Ravi. Uh, I have the privilege of leading a team, a fantastic team of about 50 to 60 people at different points in time from different disciplines. Uh, well, some of the faces in here, this is a slightly old picture, but there's a lot of my colleagues in here in the audience. Uh, and that's what makes our work special. The kind of work we do, as Madhav said, that's retail, that's what you see the fashion store for Gaurav at Emporio. We've done the new retail identity for Royal Enfield globally. That's the Cafe Lota at the Crafts Museum, which some of you might have visited. Uh, there's some art spaces like the Koj Foundation in Kirki and the Devi Art Foundation interiors in Gurgaon. Uh, that's a private residence we just finished in Jangpura. Uh, some interior, a uh, first residential interior, new foray, and uh, we also do hospitality projects. We've just got a first government commission. It's a, in Bhubaneswar for the state government and institutional building, which we're very excited about. But what I'm really here uh, to speak about is something that of late has helped me articulate very clearly what our practice, uh, where our practice has been focusing on. And it's not the what, so I describe what we do, and. You know, very often we meet people and we ask them, what do you do? And, and we, we hope that that will give us an insight to who they are. But I, I started to realize that unless you ask them why they do what they, what they do, or why do you do what you do, I don't really get to know you as a person. And I don't really get to know your volition for doing what you do. And, and that's what really, uh, you know, we've started to focus on over the past few years, saying what value can design bring, and we as a design community bring into the world we work within. And design, you know, for, for a lot of people, especially in the privileged section of society we work in, has become about aspirational, the next new iPhone, or the next cool iconic building, or so on and so forth. And the question we ask is, do we really need any more of that? Do we need yet another iconic building? Do we need a faster computer or a, a smarter phone? And especially in the context of India. And for us, it became a very pressing question because we deal with a very privileged section of society. So how do we create meaning in our work? And it's not just meaning for ourselves. We began to see that unless we began to impact a larger cross-section of people who we engage with, and are able to create meaning for everyone involved in the process. And when I say everyone, it's not just our team. It's not the design team. It's our contractors. It's the artisans. It's our client. It's the context we are working within the region. It is the socio-cultural milieu. It is the environment. The environment, sustainability is, is, is you know, it's added on like a layer. But we are finally taking something from the earth and putting something there. So do we take responsibility for that? And can our process create meaning at every level? And this is the classic determinist model, which we all start with, right? So there's the author, and there's the designer who has an idea. And then everyone else in the chain becomes a tool to achieve the end product, which should be as close to the initial idea as possible. And we spend so much time kind of fighting, uh, controlling, figuring things out, battling, especially in a country like ours, and it leaves the people who are part of the process alienated because it is this author's vision and the author needs to see the end product as close to as, you know what he thought of and then he or she thought of and then everyone else becomes a tool and then we say why is why do people not work properly why why is everyone not engaged and we start cursing the values of people but what we miss out is that we've made the end so much more important than the means to get there and that's where we started to see was there a new way of working we needed to look at especially in the country we are in. So, so we started looking at the idea of going in with a broad idea of what we were trying to accomplish. So create a set of parameters, then allow people who are part of the process, including the client, site conditions, the artisan, the contractor, the conditions at site that emerge from time to time. How many of us go to site and you know we have to change things? And very often, we look at change as a compromise. 
But we have an opportunity to look at change as an opportunity. And that then allows us to have an end product that's enriched by the constraints, by participation of people, by responses to changing scenarios, and allow it to come out differently from what you'd originally imagined, but far richer and far more participative. And this, to us, is a more inclusive way of doing things, and we are, we are on a learning journey. It has its own pitfalls, it is iterative, it is unpredictable, there's a lot of alignment with clients you need, a lot of alignment with people. It becomes more about the people than about the product, and more, than, the, than the building itself. So I'm going to walk through three, three uh, projects. This is a building that's under construction. It's in Kangra. It's for the same clients as we did Jodhpur for. Those are the views from the site. We've been blessed yet again with fantastic views. The client wanted 41 villas. It's a 19-acre parcel. And the first question we asked is, do we really need to do villas and cottages because it's a resort? And what, because what that did, did on the site was took a lot of footprint. It made navigation. It's a hilly terrain. It made construction very intense, navigation very intense. There's a tremendous amount of rain. So again, dealing with waterways, etc., became an issue. So we started looking at the idea of a singular building, which straddled the ridge of the site and used the ground floor as a single level circulation spine with all the public facilities. We stacked up all the rooms as villas on the first floor and hanging as the hill kind of meanders down on the minus one floor. And the red lines you see are actually circulation spines. So there's staircases that lead up to each room to the left and the right. And the rooms overlook the views on either side. So they're almost like private homes with no corridors leading to the rooms, which allow you views of the valley and the mountain and complete privacy. So that's how the, the kind of building straddles the site and allows the water to run off on either side of the valley. We've harnessed, we, uh, we of course, harvesting the water in indigenous systems. We started looking at the idea of luxury, and in the context of dharamshala, how do we bring in an element of spirituality and kind of this oxymoron of a luxurious monastery? And uh, so we worked with the idea of creating a rhythm which articulated that spirituality, that, that kind of rhythmic uh, piece that comes from a rhythmic expression, and the vernacular and started to work with how we would find expression towards the views to the mountain, towards the tea plantation, the sun, etc. The construction system is an RCC framework. It needs to be very seismic re uh, resistant, so it's RCC at the lower level and a light gauge street construction on the upper level, which makes it very light on top and quick to construct. Those were our first sketches, which informed the way the framing would happen. And then that's when our prototyping started, so we try and do a lot of full-scale prototypes. And we worked with this stone called Chena, which you see the gray kind of masonry, which is used in the landlord's houses in the region. And the stacked slate, which is called slot, which is used for more agricultural land burming and you know, kind of retaining walls, which is considered a very cheap stone. And as we worked on it further, we, we kind of came down to just using this really cheap material called slot, which is used for, like I said, for, for much cheaper kind of uses. And we wanted to work with Himachal craftsmen and artisans, and we found them to be really slow and lazy. And this was a pro time-bound project. So we got in the same team who'd worked in Rajasthan, a team of 40 stonemasons. They came in, there was a transfer of knowledge, and uh, kind of they did 60,000 square feet of solid stone masonry in four months. It was just incredible, and finally crafted. So that's how the elevation begins to emerge and kind of sits on the site. It's a 220-meter-long building which is two-storied and then becomes three and then four-storied. And these are under construction images. Uh, the, the building is not yet finished. So that's how it sits there. I have a little film. This was taken from a drone. My client got very excited. The project was on hold, so he wanted to kill some time, and he got a guy in to sh shoot a film. So the entire south face is solar panels, and uh, they feed a, a, a hot water boiler, which un there's underfloor heating. So that's the luxurious element. It's all the tactile elements under all the slate floors. Uh, 
Uh, the next project I'm going to speak about is a project we recently finished in Jaipur. It's at the City Palace. Um, the, the brief was to create a fine dining destination in the City Palace. The City Palace did not really have uh, any significant um, kind of F&B facility. So what we tried to do was create a space that became aspirational for both the locals who usually wanted something more contemporary and new, you know, like a lot of new construction coming up, and the tourists who wanted a heritage experience. And usually these were very separate. So you're working on the cusp of these two. And uh, so the whole expression was about reinterpreting what are regional skills and materials. That the, the red box is the site. That's how it sits within the city palace. So Chandar Mahal is the royal residence. It's flanked by the museum towards the south. And the Jaleb Chowk is actually the entrance from the city. So the current, I mean, when we got the site, this is how the, the, the cafe looked. It was a daytime cafeteria, would close at 5 o'clock when the museum closed. It had some samosas and chai and some dal chawal for lunch and kind of quite basic. And uh, the brief was to really make it, take it to the next level, make it a hip and trendy kind of place to come and hang out. So we looked at the old circulation and looked at opening it up to the city and opening up towards the shopping plaza. For that, we looked at a, a new intervention, relatively new intervention on site at removing that and instead replacing it with a pavilion which would connect the two courtyards. So the courtyard you see to the right would become the bar that would open up in the evening and the courtyard to the left would stay open during the day and there would be an entrance from the city that would connect straight to the museum as well. So an additional entrance would open up and we kind of made the courtyard very, very uh, articulated. There's some air-conditioned areas, some verandas, etc. That's the bar lounge. So the first step was what would create the canvas for this setting. And uh, so the current approach to preservation was trying to replicate what the old kind of frescoes might have been like. And each time they would do that, it would become cheaper and cheaper because there were lower time, uh, less time and lower budgets. So we thought that what else could we do for the buildings to tell their own story and a visit to a neighboring palace, abandoned palace, which was not open to public, reveal the construction of the buildings. And we started looking at the possibility of actually revealing what lay beneath all these layers to tell, for the buildings to tell their own story. So if you look at the image on the right, there's stone, there's brick, there's interventions at different points in time, but they tell their own story. We did not try to kind of make it look pretty. We worked, again, the idea was to work authentically, so there was lime, lime mortar and plaster. We set up a lime pit at site. All the colors used were natural lime. So that's the before and after. So the left shows what it was like, and those are the kind of interventions we did. So that's the admin office that was then stripped to kind of convert to the lounge. The second step was making the connecting device I spoke to you about, and we worked on this idea of a baradari, which is a traditional pavilion for congregation, for free flow of air. And we took the idea of setting up a baradari instead of the toilet block that we demolished as the connecting device. So that's the toilet block. That's after it was demolished. And that was the first sketch uh, probably the only sketch we made during the whole project, to get the proportions right and create a counterpoint for the historic buildings around. That's how it kind of began to look like. So the, the pavilion was made of fluted marble and metal and brass. So a little bit like a little piece of contemporary jewelry made in materials sourced locally. And we carry the story on further from the floors. So these are all marbles from the local quarries around Jaipur going onto the fluting in the bar. There's a water wall at one end of the courtyard for cooling the courtyard in summer. The seating that wraps around the veranda staying away from it in marble. The tikri work that I, most of you know about was reinterpreted through kind of computer generated forms, but done by hand, uh, kind of went into niches, into ceilings. Uh, we generated, again, cheap, relatively cheap plastic cane done with, with uh, furniture we designed and got ma manufactured locally in different expressions. Uh, doors, steel millwork doors that were fabricated locally with brass and uh, hardware that was custom made for the project. Some lamps which Ayush Kasliwal came and made. So that's a walk through the finished project. That's the dining room, that's the water wall at the end of the courtyard, the first floor veranda. That's the only part of the restaurant we left intact that had some beautiful frescoes. The veranda outside that. And the whole site was lit, again, keeping in mind the layers within the layers, frames within frames. 
the old framing the new, the new framing the old, and that dialogue kind of carries on the way the courtyard is framed, the outside looking in, inside looking out, and as evening sets in and the pavilion lights up, it acquires a very different expression. Uh, the last project I'm going to share very quickly is uh, a project we did for a developer. Why it's really special for us is we'd never worked with a developer, and uh, it was really, really heartening to see the approach they were willing to take. So this is in Vikroli in Bombay, where Godrej started their operations, and they have 600 acres of beautiful property there, and they're slowly developing a site after site. So this plan that you see is about 35 acres, which is a flagship development where their headquarters has been built. Um, and they, they've got kind of a whole bevy of international architects working there to create this beautiful campus. And the mandate for us when we, went, we were invited to come in was to present to them the importance of retaining three of the historic buildings with the idea of placemaking. So this came from the design team to almost convince the, the family that they need to retain these buildings. And kind of this is what we presented. And the simple idea was that you can make a very beautiful new room, but until you make it your, you, you populate it with something that's yours, there's no sense of history and emotive connect. And these buildings became markers of that memory. And I mean, we were very fortunate. They kind of bought into it. And uh, basically what we did was we looked at the old forms of the old buildings, looked at a new materiality which would age. So we said the buildings must speak of their age. And this combination of cotton and concrete kind of bleeds. So that over a period of time, the cotton steel bleeds onto the concrete, oxidizes and bleeds onto the concrete. And the building ages. So if you were to go back every year, you would see the building age like, like a human being, I mean, almost. And uh, so that's how the building transforms. It has louvers, which kind of simulate. So, so this whole site is set in rain trees, so it simulates the dapple lights through the leaves. So you can begin to see, now that's after year one. The middle image shows you the bleeding happening. So I mean, we, you know, Piroj had asked us, will this happen? And we said, yeah, yeah it's going to happen. And, and we're really happy to see it happen. A lot of um, crafted details there. The interiors, again, evoke the memories of the silos, which we used to process the chemicals. That's the marketing office. Again, everything is handcrafted. It, a lot of iterative work on discoveries made at site. That's how the site is. There's this idea of a narrative device through the site that tells the story of the development in Morse code. So it starts with English and then moves on to Morse code. And it kind of wraps around the whole site. There's silos that have been repurposed to, to create art installations to tell the legacy of the company. And uh, that's how you know the whole site activates. So the building you see across, the contemporary building, is the headquarters, and that's the courtyard. There's a little film that the clients made, which I want to show you. Um, sorry. C'est si bon de partir n'importe où, bras dessus, bras dessous. En chantant des chansons, c'est si bon de se dire des mots doux, de petits rien du tout, mais qui en disant langue, en voyant notre mineur ravie, les passants dans la rue nous envie. C'est si bon, les passants dans la rue, bras dessus, bras dessus, en chantant des chansons, quel esprit merveilleux, c'est bon, je cherche un millionnaire, voilà c'est... Uh, I'm at the end of my presentation, Madhav. There's just one thing that I want to bore you with, which is really close to my heart, is what a lot of people ask us, how does our studio work? And how do we connect, we create these projects, how does it all happen? And uh, this is the first time we're putting this out there, but we've tried to articulate what really are the values that hold us together. And I'm going to kind of read them out in random order. And this is what we really believe in. This is what we kind of hold ourselves account to, from the cook, to me, to everybody. 
And we really bring in an attitude of gratitude to our work. We are paid to do what we love doing. So no matter how small or how big, we're grateful for what we have. Uh, we honor our word and our relationships. Innovation is not like some creative genius idea that comes like a brainwave. It's a way of life. It happens slowly in small ways. It's an act of the collective. There's no hierarchy in where ideas come from. And we really look to create empowered relationships with everyone as far as possible. Trust is a really important starting point. There's no, I mean, you can't start off with suspicion. We learn every day. And when we're confused about everything, then we try and do everything with as much love as we can. So that's our own little bit.